uh, millions of people are not allowed to have an opinion and they're not allowed to be heard and they're not allowed to read things that they want to read. So that's then, this is why I think it fuels conspiracy theories, people start to say, what is it they don't want us to know? Why don't they want us to know it? We'll find alternative ways of communicating. I mean, the number of people who keep contacting me on Telegram or... I'm Nicholas Bartlett, co-owner of the world's first popcorn board game cafe, living in Fulton, Missouri, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, we are going to be re-interviewing Claire Fox, only now she is no longer Claire Fox. You will discover that she is Baroness Claire Fox because she has been uh, invited to join the House of Lords. So we get to talk to somebody that was once a very countercultural figure throughout the UK and the EU that joined the House of Lords after she and a small group of people help guide uh, the UK to actually achieving Brexit. Claire is one of my favorite people to talk with. She runs um, a thing called the Battle of Ideas where people get together from all over the world and uh, have fantastic debates and great conversations. So when you start talking with Claire, you know, she's going to hold her own, have her own perspectives, and everything she says is super nuanced. We were lucky to get her time because she's on the BBC all the time. She's got her work with the House of Lords and also, um, you know, is running the Academy of Ideas. So this was a really good chance. We're going to get to that interview, but I want to talk about a few things that Articulate Ventures is offering, which is the company that I run. So many of you know that I don't like running ads on here. So far, I've done it without um, having to do any. And so what I want to do is instead of doing ads, talk about some of the things that I'm working on and see if any of them are of interest to you. The first one is for people that are interested in in in-depth conversations. You like debate. You like encountering people that are going to say things that you don't necessarily agree with but also know how to have a reasonable conversation, then you might wanna consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. There, we have all different kinds of classes and um, programs that people can get involved in where they're encountering other people, they're talking about ideas, they're uh, talking about their businesses that they're trying to get started, and it's really a forward-moving place. So if you're the type of person that loves this podcast and you want other meet other people that do as well, join the Articulate Ventures Network by going to network dot articulate dot ventures another thing that we've been working on is a vr program so uh, my business partner ben who is the executive producer on this show he and i have done a few events in vr and if your company is thinking about what do we think the vr world is going to look like in the next couple of years we are offering a, an introductory presentation, and then we will also actually, if you have headsets, walk you through a few experiences to get you started in virtual reality. This is something that we put together for one of my clients and realize this is actually a really uh, valuable thing for everyone. So if you're interested, why don't you just uh, write an email to vance at vancecrow.com and we will uh, get you set up and we can talk all about the virtual reality events. So we're going to head into the interview. I'm so glad you're here. Enjoy these conversations and do me a favor, share them with people. We want to see this group grow. We want to see the the network grow and we want to see people that are interested in talking about ideas that are at the edge, that are pushing the envelope. And uh, we want to get more people in that like this type of conversation. So without further ado, we're going to head to an interview with Baroness Claire Fox. Claire Fox. Welcome back to the podcast. Good to be with you. Every time I see you, you are standing in the House of Lords and you're like pounding your uh, fist on the table and and shouting out loud and and it's totally different than the U.S. system. What in the hell have you been up to since we talked to you last? Yeah, well, one of the strange curveballs of history is that I was given a place in the House of Lords has led to huge numbers of conspiracy theories as to why that would be, especially as I've always been critical of an unelected chamber that decides on legislation. So I've tried to use it as a platform, that's all. And there's been plenty to argue about and talk about. It's Wait a second, you're, you're in the House of Lords? I, mean, I, I have no Lords. idea how this system I am works. Now, I am now known as Baroness Fox of Buckley. 
I oh. have been elevated. I have a position in that. I apologize, world. my uh, b- Baroness. <laughs> oh, so- please don't call me Baroness. I'm just making the point that formally that is the situation. How does uh, the how does the House of Lords differ from, say, the U.S. Senate, which is kind of the way that I think about it? So it's unelected. It's all appointees. There are some hereditary peers from the olden days, i.e. the aristocracy. There's a limited number of those people. The bishops are in there and law lords. But in, you know, in every possible way, it's undemocratic. That's the problem with it. It's, it does act as a second chamber that checks on and scrutinizes legislation. And actually the issue we're going to go on to talk about, which is Brexit, it became particularly um, controversial as a second chamber during the whole rouse over Brexit because the House of Lords is predominantly full of people who supported staying in the European Union and they did absolutely everything they could to try and thwart the referendum results of 2016. And that made uh, led to a popular discussion and debate about whether the House of Lords really should be abolished or at the very least reformed. Um, so of course it is an irony that I've ended up there. Um, partly I think because the present government were keen to you know, put people in because that's how you get in, you get nominated, um, who maybe were uh, Brexit supporters to try and balance things up a bit, an acknowledgement of the fact that I'd stood for the Brexit party in the European elections and they wanted to acknowledge that. And also because they, there's a kind of argument that if you're going to have a House of Lords, it should at least have some life to it, rather than it being a place for former former politicians who weren't elected to go and retire. So they kind of decided to add in a few uh, curveballs like me, people who would maybe not tow the party line. You know what's interesting about the comparison between systems? A lot of people don't know this, but in the U.S., the Senate used to not be elected. It used to be appointed That's by right. the House of the of the state, and so the state was sending you. And then later they turned it into an election, and so it just became really a House of Representatives members that uh, had a longer term or maybe a little bit more power. So it's yeah. interesting that the U.K. has kept your uh, your appointment system. That's right. I mean, I, I think the problem is that if you now had elections for the House of Lords, which some people would argue would be a progressive reform, the difficulty is is that it would just simply end up replicating the House of Commons. You know, it's kind of what is the purpose of it? And so in some ways, I just think abolish it, you know, even though I'd lose a job, because I think that in the end, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't, it isn't able to be representative it, it can scrutinize, but it takes its role too far. And, you know, it's uh, people are paid attendance allowance for going in. They're not paid a salary, but they're paid an attendance allowance. You don't have to do very much to earn that. And it just Wait, seems to me. Does that mean you show up each day and then you get paid for it? Or what does that mean? Yes, you get paid if you show up. And um, obviously, during the COVID crisis, there's not very many people turning up and there's a kind of half payment system if you if you turn up via zoom to join in the debates but i've (laughs) i've tried to i've tried to avoid being cynical about it i mean i i have tried to show up not because of the money i tried to become a working parent and i actually kind of started i think in october and so I've, you know, I still run the Academy of Ideas and I, that is what I consider to be well, my main job. Well, you are spending but I, a lot of time at the House of Lords because, I am, because every I'm time going, I, and I thought you were just a spectator there. So I, I actually didn't understand when I would see you talking. I thought, wow, they wanted Claire to speak again. That's uh, crazy. So I wondered what you were doing, but you're doing this and all of the Academy of yeah, Ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... When you said that the House of Lords has the ability to throw a bunch of roadblocks in for Brexit, and that's kind of what you have been navigating through, what did they throw up and and how are you now through it? So I think for a period of time, you know, I think maybe for your audience to understand, when the referendum happened in 2016, it was not expected that the vote would go to leaving the European Union. In the build up to that referendum, most of the establishment, all of the main political parties, very, you know, but practically everybody respectable as it were, 
argued that we should stay in the European Union. Even people who'd previously been quite critical of the European Union ended up arguing to stay. And, you know, this included the whole of uh, university vice chancellors, you know, science organisations, the arts organisations. So it really felt as though the, 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 there was kind of hardly anyone in respectable society, as it were, certainly amongst the ruling elites and the media elites who were for it. So it was a real shock to the system when Leave won in 2016. And for the first period of time, I think, um, it was pretty obvious that, whereas those of us who voted Leave just because we were asked a constitutional question, we decided that we wanted to leave. We just thought it would be enacted. It soon became clear that there was a, a pretty determined effort to, to stop us leaving the European Union come what may, either to water down our relationship or water down what leave would mean so that we effectively stayed connected to the European Union absolutely uh, in a variety of ways. And that caused huge amounts of bitterness. Some people just arguing to overturn the vote. And what, every time... Um, anything like that would occur, the House of Lords would vote to ensure that you couldn't just leave that, you know, they were just constantly saying, no, 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 we're not going to let this happen, which obviously is a terrible affront to democracy. And in some ways that radicalised Leave voters and many people who voted Remain as well, because they suddenly realised the British establishment had asked a question to the British people when the British people voted the wrong way, they weren't going to ignore them anyway and going to just trample over their wishes. So that itself became the focus of discussion, whether actually a referendum was legitimate and how it would be enacted. And that has dragged on for years. And eventually, eventually, having deadline upon deadline been you know, done away with or extended and it looked like it was never going to happen, eventually it... We stayed so long that we ended up having to stand in these European elections in March 2019. Now, I can't even remember the day. Oh, but, no, the summer of 2019. And we meant to have left by then, by the way. That was a, after a deadline where we would never have had to stand in those uh, European parliamentary elections. When those elections had to happen just because we'd ended up staying, that's when uh, the Brexit party was formed and a cross party alliance, which included me, stood as candidates in those elections and out of nowhere won dramatically and humiliated the mainstream parties, Conservatives, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, came after the Brexit party, which had just literally been formed. And that changed everything. The Conservative party suddenly realized that they could no longer get away with fudging this decision um, Theresa May was deposed as the leader of the Conservative Party. Eventually, Boris Johnson became the leader of the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister. And he declared that he would now honour the 2016 referendum, no ifs, no buts. And that's kind of what happened. When we see Boris Johnson in the news, well, I'll just speak for myself. I have no context as to, is he an intelligent person? Is he good at getting people to get along? Because he is portrayed as an absolute buffoon in, in a, in a way that is almost cartoonish where you're like, I don't think this can be true, but I've never taken the time to figure out, is this a legit positive leader or just the guy that happened to be sitting there? So he's uh, incredibly, uh, has been very popular, maybe in a populist way. Uh, he's very smart, very intelligent, but he does, bluster and he's certainly not on top of the detail but he has inspired a certain following because he's at least got kind of that kind of character that makes people think that he's you know a, a bit different doesn't fit into the mold even though in fact he's absolutely well and truly part of the establishment but the main thing is what he represented it, when he became the head of the conservative party um which which was that he he basically promised to honor uh, popular sovereignty to say we will leave and as the whole debate around Brexit was about sovereignty it was about who has control who has power should the British people um, have uh, be able to hold uh, legislators to account which they couldn't if those decisions were made in Brussels or Strasbourg via the EU he became a, a kind of new hero for the populace in some ways 
which was very unlikely because the Conservative Party aren't associated generally with kind of mass ranks of working class people. They are, you know, that would be the Labour Party historically, but the, his, the Labour Party had somehow managed to get itself into a position where it was arguing against the EU referendum results and therefore pitted itself against many millions of working class people. So Which Boris I, Johnson okay, let me, let me, gained uh, certain trust. That's all I'm saying, ironically. Well, so one of the things that I observed was that you were standing up in front of crowds of throngs of people, like masses of people that I, I think most human beings will never have that experience what was it like to be riding that wave and not knowing whether or not it would actually come to fruition? I think it was, uh, well, I mean, it was, for me, it was an extraordinary privilege on the one hand, but it, I think what it summed up when they first set up the Brexit party and, you know, I'd never had any desire to be an elected politician. I, I was perfectly happy with the, the world and the life that I was leading but I felt that people would become disillusioned with democracy unless they had the ballot box to express their continued desire to do what they voted for in 2016. I thought it was a very dangerous moment for democracy to remove that ballot box and to, to make people cynical about democracy. So when you ask what it felt like to stand in front of people, in some ways it was joyous because people were so relieved to have an alternative way of expressing their views that they were excited to have this party to vote for just temporarily during those European elections. Um, and that then forced the Conservative Party to change. And then they then they loaned their votes. Maybe it's only a loan their votes to the Conservative Party to say to Boris Johnson, who looked them in the eye and said he would get Brexit done. They said, OK, we'll vote for you then. It's not we're not naturally Conservatives, but we'll vote for you. So I was very pleased to be part of that historical moment that could actually remind people because people were so, I can't tell you how in despair they were. And what, what you've also got to understand now, this does reflect a little bit on some of the discussions in America, um, was that because people had voted in a constitutional referendum to leave the European Union, which, you know, we were asked whether we wanted to or not, by the prime yeah, minister. Don't ask me if we, you're not going to listen yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But they were called racists and xenophobes and little Englanders who didn't care about anyone. And, you know, especially the accusation of racism was particularly irritating for people. And not irritating because it was so insulting. And, and so people didn't just feel that they were being sold out in terms of the vote. They also felt that they were being traduced. You know, it was the UK equivalent of being called the deplorable. Um, there was this phrase that was used, they were kind of labelled gammon, you know, white, red, ruddy faces, you know, working class, you know, type. I mean, it was just vile. And so I, despite the fact that actually a third of ethnic minorities in the UK voted to leave the European Union, somehow this notion of them, of these kind of backward oiks who were knuckle dragging, you know, took hold and it kind of split society into this kind of very elitist way of looking at things versus ordinary people and for millions of ordinary people they just felt furious and and it was toxic so it was nice to be part of something that was positive which said actually we did know why we voted to leave the European Union we still think we want to leave the European Union you can't just uh, besmirch our character and ignore us any longer, we're going to force you to do this. And in fact, that's what happened. The electorate in the end had their way. And we've just arrived at the culmination of that now because the trade deal has been signed and Brexit has effectively happened. There's no going back, in other words. And so what what changes in the world now that Brexit has said we're not a part of the EU? How does that tangibly yeah. impact other every other relationship with other countries? So first of all, it, in some ways it's difficult because it, Brexit was never a destination, it was a start. I mean, that sounds trite, but what I mean is some people say, well, what do we get now? You know, where's your Brexit dividend Then we want to see it? Well, it doesn't really operate like that. It's about uh, democratic accountability. So it's more that you've removed the layer of decision-making that was not accountable to the British electorate. So that's why it was important. So you don't immediately see gains. In fact, if anything, it's quite disruptive initially. Um, partly, some of us believe that 
trying to negotiate a trade deal with the European Union actually would carry on entangling our relationship with them in a way that was going to be unhelpful. But nonetheless, Boris Johnson uh, uh, carried on with that and there is now a trade deal signed. So in some ways, the trade deal with the EU means that trading will still occur with the EU. But just to use one very pertinent example at the moment, if you're a member of the European Union, you as a nation state can't on a wide range of issues, make certain decisions on your own. You have to get the agreement of the other 27 nation states. So the most uh, uh, visceral example of that at the moment is on vaccines. You know, the, the, the COVID vaccine situation is such that the uh, numbers of vaccines being administered in the European Union amongst the member states is very, very low at the present time. Largely because no individual countries could sign their own trade agreements in relation to the vaccines. Yeah, they couldn't say we'll buy this many vaccines because it was said, no, you've got to, everyone's got to do it at the same time, start at the same time. And they've got themselves into a real mess on that. Whereas the UK is actually on that issue well ahead in relation to vaccines and has actually been able to do its own, make its own decisions about who it did work, trade with in relation to vaccinations. But there's a whole range of other things. A, a, a point you'll be familiar with will be something like um, the precautionary principle, which has been used in many ways to thwart the development of, for example, GM crops in the UK, if you wanted them, right? If the British population wanted them, you couldn't have them. It didn't matter because so the for, EU wouldn't let you. So for people that aren't aware, this is a big deal because it basically sets up your framework for how your regulations are created and how new innovations can enter the market. And so um, if you want to have an innovative society, you need to be able to take some risks. But the precautionary principle says you have to prove that this does no harm if the if there's a chance that it could have a substantial impact on things well it's next to impossible to prove a negative and so what you do is you then have a cabal of people that are getting put in charge inside of a black box and they say this is okay and that's not okay and when you ask them why they say ah, precautionary principle and so decisions become entirely made up of uh politics instead of saying can we have a standard that we can meet and then and use that as this as the single gauge of rail so we can work together. Exactly. And the the the, uh, the rules based system deployed by the European Union, which you know represents all of its member states, is a kind of iron fist. It becomes like an international law. You're not allowed to break it if you're a member of the European Union. They say, and by the way, when I say they, I mean this really is unelected technocrats in 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 you know closed rooms, making decisions about the standards, which are then uh, uh, basically dictated to the member states, the nations that are members of the European Union. And that's because the EU uh, is essentially a bureaucracy. It's it's saying like, we're going to put in uh, weights and measures, and we need people to make sure all the weights and measures add up. So we don't go elect them. You you install them the same way you do for somebody for the USDA, or they apply for a job. And so it's just an ocean of bureaucrats yes and it's got a you know a court of justice which is draconian at, in its implementation and it's uh, uh making you pay i mean it, it you know the kind of fines it levels at nation states that break any of its rules and so on and so forth so it really is a very tight uh, and prescriptive set of rules and organizations. So there's one elected part of it, which is the European Parliament, which I was part of, but the European Parliament, ironically, cannot initiate legislation. It acts, if you want, as the House of Lords does. So it's elected in which, but you're elected not to make any rules, but to rubber stamp those rules that are being made by the unelected. So it's one of those great, everybody will say to me, oh, the EU is, democratic because you have elections but actually to the most to the to the part of the european union which has least power which is the parliament it's kind of a talking shop in the real sense of the word so the yeah so the european union um you know has moved towards a kind of more federalist uh, relationship over recent years it started off just as a trade organization a trade gathering around uh, uh, coal and steel, and now it's gone on to become a more political project. Now, if you can imagine a situation, I mean, obviously the US is a Fed is made up of federal states, but 
nation states within the European Union are treated as though they're federal states, if you see what I mean. But there was never an agreement made where, you know, no nation state was created whereby a European citizen would be given access to democratic accountability of all the people who make decisions in Europe. So it cheated. It avoided the civil war bit. You know, it avoided the bit where you forge that state and you forge that central state out of the different states into a nation state. Well, and the Civil War is a good example of how you, they forged together a federalist power. But then also, essentially, the bureaucracy is what continued to allow the state's power to just creep and creep and creep and creep. Because once you get the ability to tax and print your own money, now all of a sudden your ability to say, well, we'll give you some of this money to build things that you want, but you have to give control over what is the drunk driving uh, limit? What is this thing and that thing? And then all sorts of trade standards. And um, I think there's a perception that we were always in this centralized um, national government that that really has only occurred in the last 30, 40 years, expanded in the way that it has. Yes, that's true. But it's uh, it, it, it non nonetheless, there is a kind of consent in relation to the way the U.S. has developed. And all I'm saying is, is that what's happened is, is that the people who are at the top of the EU want that federal situation where they dictate what happens in the member states. But they, you know, there's a it, there's a tension because they still are nation states. They are nation states. And the way that you have democratic decision making is by voting in your prime minister or your president or whatever form you've got. But, you know, you'll see that there, at the moment there's a massive row going on about um, what's happening in Poland and Hungary in particular in this instance, because the EU is saying, you're member states, uh, you're doing things that go against our rule book. And they say, but we were elected on the basis of doing these things at home by our own, you know, by our electorate. We're accountable to them, not you. And then they say, well, if you don't do what we tell you from on high and ignore what you promised your electorate, we will fine you or kick you out or punish you in some way. So it's federalism by the back door. You know, it's not explicit, but it's a, it's a way of creating a federal unit that has that power to dictate what nation states do. That's why it's such an affront to democracy. And, you know, national sovereignty is important to me. It's a very important principle. And so I, I, that's one of the reasons I voted to leave. So that's the kind of things that are at stake and that were being discussed uh, all the way along. The other thing you say about currency, the UK were never part of the Eurozone, but the EU does have its currency. You didn't have to join the Eurozone to be part of the EU. And so the UK didn't join the Eurozone. But I can tell you now that that control of currency has been used to impose the most awful punitive um, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, stipulations on places like Greece and Spain and Portugal, particularly those countries, because the European bank is absolutely rules the roost and tells me, you know, and in get, involves itself in politics, says, well, it doesn't matter what budget you decided, we'll tell you what budget you live by. This is to a country, remember. These are countries. They aren't just... You know, they are countries in their own right, so but they're treated you like have naughty this children. You have this feeling of sovereignty, and because you kept your currency, you guys had a chance to leave in a different way. Yeah. But if somebody like Italy decides to just pack up and leave, what are they going to do? Because at a minimum, they would still be held um, pretty pretty tightly if you still have your currency connected with, with what's going on in Brussels. Well, I, I think the only way would be, that's why it's very difficult, but it's also for those countries to consider leaving because they're very tied in. But you could, in a way, see it a bit like declaring yourself bankrupt, which is you could leave and start again. I mean, that's I bet, what they'd have to do. I mean, maybe that's where the crypto future goes. Maybe if yeah, you have I a mean, sovereignty movement. People, yeah. So, and the people are saying that. And just, just, just quickly to to add that, um, you know, a lot of people were so shocked at the way the EU treated Greece in particular uh, during the recession and 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 what was called the eurozone crisis, um, that a lot of people in in the UK, even though they weren't part of the eurozone, as an act of solidarity, could just see that the EU apparatchiks were just bullies, and that this was something that you know, to emphasise 
when the UK decided to leave the EU, it wasn't a little Englander feeling. It was a sense of what was just and right. And a lot of it actually was in solidarity with what had happened in different European countries. It wasn't just an attempt to say we don't want anything to do with any of these countries. It was not wanting to have anything to do with the EU as an institution, not European countries per se. Well, let me uh, this brings up an interesting uh, parallel which is what was the news saying? Like, how did a narrative of we're doing this in solidarity of Greece uh, come about among the people if the establishment wanted um, to stay in the EU? Because in the U.S., it appears that when the establishment wants something, it's the same thing as what the media wants. Yeah, I mean, that's effectively the, the, the alternative narrative was thrown up in some ways simply by the question of the referendum. Once you had a referendum and the referendum was called, the establishment then had to tell people that it was worthwhile voting in it. So they then had to motivate people to vote in it by saying this is the most important, and they actually did say this. They said, this is the most important vote you will ever make in your life. This is, we are trusting you to decide on the, con on the future constitutional arrangements that this country makes. And quite a lot of people who'd previously been apathetic or never voted or not thought that anyone cared what they thought suddenly felt that each vote would count, which it did in a referendum. Each vote counts, right? It's a 50 50 situation. So that, in a way, kick started a genuine debate. And people started to say, which way are you going to vote in the referendum? And there was an establishment and media narrative. But they made this mistake of basically, defensively involving themselves in a narrative that tried to uh, uh, demonize anyone who was even thinking of voting leave. And by doing that, they they were, already, instead of that working, it actually had the impact of people thinking, well, I'm considering voting leave. Why are you calling me? Uh, you know, I'm gonna find out about this. So there was a lot of self-education. So for a period in the build up to the, uh, the referendum, something which the media themselves never reflect, Everywhere you went, you know, you go to the hairdresser, you go to the shop, you go to take the kids to school, you'd be in the pub. Everyone was talking about what are you going to do in the EU referendum? And then everyone would argue about it. And they were reading around, you know, they were going to libraries, they were looking online. So the, the media narrative was such that the media didn't realise that millions of people were not taking any notice of their narrative which is why the media got such a shock when people voted to leave, because they believed their own hype. They thought the only people who were going to vote leave were, a, you know, a sort of hardcore bunch of lunatics who didn't understand anything, right? And then they lost. They were outraged. How could that have happened? Because they didn't actually listen to the country. They didn't reflect the country. And they actually, in some ways, helped create... A, an alternative narrative, which was, let's find out for ourselves. And that was very positive for democracy. I'm I'm really concerned about uh, the future because the very thing that you're describing, where there were blogs, there were things for people to go and read, in the U.S., now that the there was the people that decided they were going to rush into the Capitol, break things, push back with the police, a woman got shot, like bad things happened in that space. If you label that as um, uh, sedition or that these people were actually trying to overthrow the government, thinking that they would then install their own government, then looking in all of the places where they were uh, collecting together and getting together and talking would make sense. But if this is a group of people that had like some outside ideas that got whipped up into a frenzy and probably went too far, then increasing the domestic terrorism like uh the amount that we're going to do surveillance and check into people and label them i think is going to have a kickback response in the united states where we're we we are going to see the very thing that they're looking for which right now exists but in very very small pockets so that's not just a u.s issue i mean that's exactly the same here so i i i think that it had got to a point in the brexit situation probably in 2019 where if brexit hadn't been delivered it would have so alienated people there could have been some civil unrest i mean that's what i was worried about yeah i mean genuinely 
that was abated and Brexit has now happened. But Brexit isn't the only game in town and the international consequences of what's happening in America are being felt here. So we all watched on in horror at what happened in Capitol Hill. It was a shock to see it. But yes, there is now a row about whether it was a planned coup, uh, a, an act of terrorist insurrection, or whether, as you say, it was undoubtedly an out of control, unsavory, in my view, completely unhelpful, you know, in, intervention. And, and it was out of control, that's true. But you're right. Now we have a situation which I think is very precarious because it's not just happening there, because in the UK, lots of people are shocked by the fact that Twitter removed Donald Trump from his account. Uh, regardless of what you think of Donald Trump, even if you suspended him, suspended him for 24 hours, to take him out whilst he's the president of the US that feels a bit coup-like itself because we now know that the big tech companies are themselves hugely influential. I mean, they are the power brokers and they are not elected or answerable to any of us. And so when I then hear, you know, the, the new administration, uh, but who were legitimately elected, good. But then when they start to use what happened at Capitol Hill, in a way that I think can be incredibly illiberal and dangerous and authoritarian in order to deal with Trump voters or anyone who doesn't go along with a particular narrative on Capitol Hill. And you can see that happening. I mean, it's not just the people who were involved in that uh, uh, invasion of Capitol Hill who are being treated as though they're terrorists. Anyone who says they might not be terrorists is treated as though they're a terrorist enabler. And then you get to a situation, as you say, where you also drive these movements underground. You can radicalise them. You, you end up doing, I mean, you explained it better than me, you end up creating such a toxic febrile atmosphere, such a deep sense of resentment. And it doesn't matter what one thinks about Donald Trump. Tens of millions of people voted for him, even when he lost. You know, this is not some minor figure in American politics. This is somebody with a huge popular base. And the way and to thwart somebody that has a huge popular base, if that's what you want to do, is through the system, through the mechanism that you built long before either of you got there. It, but because if you start monkeying around and making it like I'm going to change the rules or I'm going to when we do win and we do get power, we're going to ratchet it up as high as we can, then that pendulum is just going to swing further and further back. And I don't think society will handle instability. They would rather have a less optimal situation over the long term than they would to have it be chaotic and, and not understood. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways, though, that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump actually didn't win, because he became associated with that chaos. You know, in, in many ways, his, his, his erratic narcissism, regardless of what you think of his policies, was very difficult to stomach, even if you thought some of what he was doing, some people, you know, might have said, well, I, I, I quite like his policies, but my God, I just want a bit of quiet. You know, maybe the Democrats will bring a bit quiet into the world. I actually think that it's a real tragedy for me that, um, first of all, I do think that Donald Trump's reaction to, you know, not having an overall win has been an example of an anti-democratic refusal to give losers consent, which is one of the complaints I had against the Remain establishment, by the way, in the Brexit argument, which was they wouldn't give losers consent. Losers consent is important. I don't mean there should have been no challenge. I don't know that any. term. What does that mean? Losers, Lo losers consent. consent is a, a key part of democracy, which is you accept that you've lost. You know, you accept you, there's an election, you lose, you accept it. Otherwise, you have chaos, don't you? You don't have to change your mind. You just have to say, I accept it. That's what a peaceful transition is. You say, I give losers consent. You know, I, that's what happens... You might bitterly resent it. You might be furious. You might think 
anything, but you have to accept that. If like in the UK, when Brexit happened, the establishment refused to give, or huge sections of the establishment refused to give losers consent to Brexit happening, that was what caused the chaos here. And Donald Trump did the same, or Trump supporters did the same in the US more recently. And um, the, 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 the Romanians don't like the comparison I make when I say that they're a bit like, a, you know, Trump was. But I do think that Trump did a huge amount of damage there. However, it does seem to me to be a completely short-sighted and foolish thing for the Democrats to have behaved, you know, in the way they have, because they should then say, right, OK, it's taken a while for him to eventually concede, but he's conceded now. We should just go in calmly and run the country because we won the election. Instead, there feels like a vengeful, punitive attempt at removing any vestige of support for a Donald Trump style of politics. Now, in view of how many people voted for Donald Trump, that seems to me to be a very dangerous strategy because it can only lead to divisiveness, um, suspicion, and a loss of faith in the democratic system. And archipelagos of where people will get together to talk about what they think is real and true and what knowledge and where are they going to get their news? People are going to be on these islands that are just chains of islands that are so far away from other people. We, we already didn't have the same narrative, but we are going to split into entirely different, like, what, what, where is the focus of the country? Is it Washington, D.C., or will it be somewhere else? It's, I agree with you that it's very dangerous. So when you um, have been running Battle of Ideas for all these years, you've probably learned a lot about the value of letting people that you don't agree with you speak. So as you think about the tech company shutting down ideas or pay, um, what was that? Um, Parler. Uh, yeah, Parler getting, getting knocked out. Like, what's your take on this? Well, I just think it's, I mean, it, it so obviously fuels conspiratorial thinking. I mean, it is censorship. Of course, everybody will say, well, they're just private companies. They're entitled to decide who is, uses them and what basis on which they're used. But the treatment of Parler is an example where you see something more sinister happening, I think, because there you have a situation where you say, I'm, I'm knocking you off Twitter uh, because I don't like your views, you know, um, go elsewhere, start your own platform. You know, you can't use Facebook anymore because Facebook have decided that go use your own platform. So a new platform emerges, which is Parler, which, by the way, I've got no interest in because it's I don't this doesn't appeal to me because I think it's too much of an echo chamber. But that's not the point. Point is, a new platform is created and then the big tech companies refuse to allow that new platform to happen by taking away, you know, uh, 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 either YouTube, uh, taking away their space, you know, and all the things that have happened. Now, what does that say to people? It says that uh, millions of people are not allowed to have an opinion and they're not allowed to be heard and they're not allowed to read things that they want to read. So that then, this is why I think it fuels conspiracy theories, people start to say, what is it they don't want us to know? Why don't they want us to know it? We'll find alternative ways of communicating. I mean, the number of people who keep contacting me on Telegram or I can't remember what the, you know, there's various of the kind of more encrypted groups and people sort of, in other words, they go deeper in as much as they can. I mean, at this rate, people will start writing letters to each other, might even phone each other. But, you know, what's happening is not that people will stop communicating with each other. They will find ways of communicating outside of the public realm. And that the, whether we like it or not, Twitter and Facebook and these big platforms have become like the public square. And to therefore remove uh, those people whose views um, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook have decided don't fit in with the narrative seems to me to be uh, an explicit uh, admission that they're going to censor things according to only one way of understanding the world. How dangerous is that? Yeah, to me, the the tech companies doing this was like making the final f wave of the flag that says government, just so you know, we decide who becomes president, who become representatives, senators. And so they have no choice now but to grab control of it. I don't want that. I don't want more um, 
legislation or regulation or tell them who they can and can't do. I don't want people to be told they have to bake cakes that they don't have to bake. Like I want as little interaction as possible. But if you're a sitting government and you know the guy over there has the power to make it so you are cut off from the world even seeing you exist, you got to grab control of that because it's a threat to your sovereignty. Well, that's the irony, isn't it? That in this instance, the governments are using big tech in many instances. So in the UK, um, both the uh, Conservative Party and the opposition, uh, the Labour Party, are calling on big tech to censor misinformation about the virus and about the pandemic. So they, 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 they're empowering them to censor. And we're, going, we're about to have a piece of legislation in the UK called the Online Harms Bill, which again, is all about threatening big tech that they must censor certain types of things or they'll be irresponsible. Now, originally, those big tech companies said, we're not publishers. Why should we do that, right? We just, you know, we, 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 we just, people, it's a free speech space, they used to say, until fairly recently. So the, the irony of it is that governments have given big tech the authority to decide what is misinformation, what is dangerous ideas, and encourage them to do it around things like hate speech, which is an ambivalent subjective term, but then now more recently around misinformation around uh, 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 the uh, coronavirus. Once they've given them that authority and demanded it, I mean, I saw AOC, you know, demanding in America, I want you to tell us what you're gonna do to remove misinformation, right? You then do that, they then do it, and in this instance, of course, the Democrats might be delighted because they've taken out their opponent, right? But what happens if Twitter decides to take down Biden's Twitter account, right? Who decides? You know, are you going to say, oh, they're okay? Well, that becomes the be mob. The mob decides. Yeah. that, And, like, we've created a digital mob that yeah. in, in many ways is its own nuclear weapon, right? Like, you can uh, either knock somebody out so they can't communicate the... I think one of the biggest challenges with this um, the misinformation is the government was clearly and demonstrably wrong as they went through coronavirus. They said things that they later literally said the opposite of. And there's no price to be paid there except for if somebody was kicked off for arguing when the government said that you shouldn't wear masks, do they get to come back on after the government changes their position? I doubt it. No, well, that's a problem. But also, in a situation where you have something so novel as a coronavirus, where we don't, the scientists don't understand everything about it, let's be honest, where you have a new variant now. So, of course, it's not even a done deal. How can you say that the science is settled or done? How can you allege that you know exactly? And some of these issues are political. There is a debate to be had surely about the cost of lockdowns because there is a huge cost of locking down society. the uk is locked down completely now right and oh, there really? is a big cost. i know nothing yeah, about where you guys are at with corona we're completely locked down everything's closed right so so we're locked in locked down there is a huge um economic cost going to emerge in that there's also mental health costs there's the fact that they're cancelling operations for people with cancer, you know, all of these things are going on. Now, I don't mean that's 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 me simplifying what the arguments against lockdowns might be. The arguments for lockdown are that this stops transmission. It's the only thing that can really hold a fast, uh, uh, fastly contagious new variant that's spreading throughout the UK. There's arguments about whether you should do that or not. But there should be arguments, right? These are discussions because there's huge pros and cons to both sides. However, if you challenge the lockdown, you're sent to be uh, an anti-science, you know, COVID denier, the word denier purposefully deployed, you know, to, to um, put you in the camp of kind of some fascist lunatic, anti-science, of course, because, you know, that means that you're irrational and unscientific. You know, people lump together people like me who are quite critical of the government's lockdown strategies because they won't do a balance, you know, they won't do a kind of balancing 
harms, balancing risks uh, assessment. They won't be honest and open, I don't think, on that. And people will say, oh, you know, you're just fueling QAnon conspiracy theories. Like, what? You know, but they can they can demonize you by putting you all in the camp, in the same camps. And that, of course, then means that there's no nuance. And you were asking about, you know, the battle of ideas. One of the things that's been a great regret in the last, I mean, actually in quite toxic times around Brexit in the UK, but also I think in the US, pretty toxic, div divisive discussions around Trump, but even around Black Lives Matter, some of these contentious issues where nuance is just banned. You know, nuance, uh, uh, you know, what about, what if, can we discuss the complexities of an issue are completely ruled out of order because you say, you, hesit you hesitantly say, could this be the issue? And you get immediately called a COVID denier. That, that kind of forces people into camps. They either feel they can't speak at all, dangerous, because they do speak, although they go elsewhere where you can't see them, or- And they only they speak with people that already agree with them, exactly. right? When you, when you get into that situation, the only people yeah. that you're able to interact exactly. with are like, yeah, you know what, you're right. And also this other crazy conspiracy theory that's exactly what's happening. And that is what's happening. It's, it, I can see it happening. I, I can see it happening every day. And that frightens me because it means that the sense of being reasonable, uh, not, not centrist in a way where you don't have opinions or you're you know, sitting on the fence or you, you've got no principle and you change all the time, but just that sense of saying, well, you know, have things, I, I, I think things have changed objectively in relation to coronavirus in terms of the new variants in the UK because a lot more people are catching it. But I want to be able to ask questions about that. I want to be able to explore that. What does that mean? Does that mean we do need to have more draconian uh, uh, policies or are we giving up freedoms forever? Or what's the cost in terms of people's uh, livelihoods? All of these things, yeah? But you can't even have those kind of conversations at the moment. So when you look out at the world, you know, five years from now, um, are we in a period of time that's equivalent to just before the Treaty of Westphalia, where something dramatic changes to the way that countries are structured? Because while it doesn't feel like anybody's preparing to attack one another, it does feel like people are are erupting somehow from from inside. And you have to wonder if that internal eruption doesn't result in, I don't know if it's different borders or it's different rules, but it seems like something's coming. I think you're... I don't know whether it will be the West failure change in relation to nation states, but I think that you're right to identify. A lot of people have tried to suggest that Biden getting elected over Trump shows that what is dubbed populism is over. Whereas I actually think that completely misassesses what's happened. I think that the whole, uh, the, the election of Donald Trump in some ways uh, represented a rejection of mainstream political parties, including the Republican mainstream. The, um, the Brexit vote in a completely different way, it's not that they're the same, but it represented a rejection of a technocratic elite doing two people, people demanding that they have more say. We've seen throughout Europe and throughout the world the, the eruption of new forces and the reason I mention that is because I don't think that's over. I think that was the unraveling of the post-war settlement. And it's not over, it's only just started. The disruption of it's only just started. We just don't know what way it's gonna go. Now, history's thrown a curveball at us because the coronavirus, who was ever gonna expect that, right? And nobody. And that's had an impact, as we know, on the whole world. And the fact that we voted in the UK to leave the EU, uh, under the slogan, take back control because we didn't want to be dictated to by unelected technocrats, couldn't be more ironic because we've had Brexit and every day we sit and watch a press conference in which unelected technocrats tell us what they're going to do to us to deprive us of our liberties again in the name of public health. So I hardly feel as though that <laughs> battle has been won. But it's not as though everything is resolved. And I think that once the immediate threats of this virus go, and it might still take months and months the way things are going, um, I don't mean months and months before the political 
decision is made to effectively allow things to return to normal, I think we can say that there's going to be a different political landscape emerging. I, I'm worried by some of it. Um, I think that driving people underground, some of these conspiracy theories, a deep nihilistic cynicism about the political elite um, is not a is not a positive, constructive thing. A healthy skepticism is what I'd want, but it's almost as though the elite won't allow you to be healthily skeptical. So they drive people to this nihilistic place. That seems to me to be very dangerous. So only just starting as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and this idea that we somehow don't have secure elections is is probably one of the most decaying things that you can have. Because in addition to having masks on so we can't see each other's faces and emotions or anything like that, now we've said, all right, now looking forward four years, um, the next election will be controlled by the social media and there are you know a huge percentage, a non-trivial percentage of the population believes that the elections were not correct and like i have no idea i think the elections probably reflected enough votes that biden should be in office but i also think there were some really weird things that happened with that election and i had always just kind of assumed they were secure and maybe they're not nearly as secure as i thought either way like you know the the paradigm of would you rather have an election that's secure but everybody thinks it's not secure or would you ha have an election that it's not secure but everybody thinks is secure i don't know which one is better but i think they both lead to pretty big problems i, I agree and I, I i think this can only i i've been thinking about that myself because we've got rather big not national elections but local elections due in may but they also involve elections for the welsh uh, assembly and the Scottish uh, government and they're talking about postponing those elections now because of coronavirus which is going to cause chaos because people are going to be very suspicious of democracy postponed and already there's last year's mayoral elections were put off and we're still not going to have them now so people start to lose faith in the ballot box don't they and then the whole issue around postal ballots which is not only an issue in the US, but it's a big issue in the UK as well. You know, if you were to have an increase in the number of postal ballots, would anyone trust that? Because people don't tend to trust postal ballots in the same way because they think, well, were they coerced? Is a family into voting in a particular way? You know, all these kind of arguments. It somehow seems very different than turning up and putting your X, you know, the physical act which obviously we know Trump has kind of played on that a fair amount uh, uh, in his querying of the results. I, 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 I do think that uh, Trump didn't win. I mean, it'd have been a, I mean, my argument is, you know, if he'd have won substantially, he'd have won substantially, we'd all know, right? So he didn't do enough politically to win. And by the way, if you watched him during the start of the election campaign, you could see that he wasn't doing enough to win politically. I mean, he kind of was, you know, that first press conference was so bad. He was so awful in it. But nonetheless, um, I, I don't want to say that you should never be able to query an, an, an election. I don't argue that the uh, Republicans who were querying the election should not be able to say there might have been mistakes made here. But I think the general irrationality of the cynicism around the elections is is over the top, but it shows the breakdown of trust. So I know UK, people in the UK who are convinced that, that Biden stole the election, you know, convinced that millions of votes were destroyed, you know, all this. I mean, they're kind of, they can tell you, you know, on Wednesday, the sun should such, somebody was seen walking with a ballot box, dumping them, you know, it's like, because that's one thing social media does is they're in touch with all the Trumpites in America, right? So that kind of generalized feeling of discontent that then takes the focus of a disbelief in democracy is very dangerous. I mean, obviously, I did not feel aspect. good about this election at all. No, like, no, but no. when I when I, as I watch it, I think, well, they've never done that many um, votes where they've just sent them out by mail and they've never done these things and they've never done those things. And yeah. so I think you would be foolish to say there's no chance that this was not fraud. Like, there's just no, like, it's so many things changed in the United States that it's possible. However, I'm with you. 
We have to have a, de- a dominant narrative, and it doesn't do us any good to be like, let's be in this middle place. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Let's choose a path and go forward because you, otherwise we don't have a country. Yeah, and, and also you can have fraud in it, not necessarily. I mean, I'm not saying fraud's good. You can have fraud in it. Oh, I, 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 it seems to me that there was pockets of fraud. I mean, I don't know the detail, but those pockets of fraud seem convincing. That's not the same as saying that Trump won. If you know what I mean, but but what but you're right. The thing that's changed is the disbelief on either side. And at the moment, all I'm saying is is that the Democrats are in a hugely important position because they can uh, stop some of the more egregious uh, uh, polarization happening if they play it well. It's just I'm not seeing much sign of that. I mean, the opposite. I mean, I just think be classy, guys. You know, don't do this. You know, don't. Don't pursue this in this way. You coming over as being too vicious, too, you know, you don't need to do that. Best let, you know, uh, Trump kind of disappear into the wilderness if you want. But 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 what they're doing is not having the impact of, of making Trumpism go away. It will turn it into a, a martyr narrative that will fuel it. So it seems stupid. I I completely agree with this uh that like the, you've never seen a basketball game where the winning team like uh celebrates and mocks the other people and you're like oh that was a good decision I'm glad you did that that made the whole thing better it only make it only and with it being people's real lives and with people feeling like the decisions that they're making are going to reshape my entire life or my entire future or whether I have my gun or whether I can educate my child the way that I want I mean, this is not a thing to flaunt in people's faces. Yeah. And and at the very least, um, I, yes, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I suppose the the point that I would make is, is that they could try now, because if you win, you have to then try and take people with you. But the bitterness is a very deep. And, you know, there's a big argument here about whether Brexiteers or people who voted Brexit were too too uh, ungracious to the Remain uh, voters and, you know, they could have, could be more generous. Um, and I think if, if actually um, the referendum results had happened and been enacted straight away in 2016, that wouldn't have happened. But because things got so bitter for four years, people turn into enemies, you know, real enemies. And I mean, you know, that's what it's like in America now. I know it's what it's like. It's still like that here. I mean, people are vicious. I mean, you know, it's not just families falling out. I mean, it's people are vicious. I mean, you know, there's a kind of thing. This is not even whether you're a conservative or a Labour or whether you're left wing or right wing. But, you know, it's kind of what side you were on in the Brexit wars. You know, people won't go out with somebody who voted Remain or vice versa. You know, all of these things feel as though they're permanently in place at dividing us. And so that's a very unhelpful thing. That's why I just think it's, a shame that the pursuit of Donald Trump is taking the form of changes in the law that will effectively, um, you know, potentially criminalize even be the kind of person who might have voted for him. Well, uh, you and, know, and I think mean, that's very dangerous myself. And I don't think it was a coup. I, I, your assessment of it is is was spot on for me. But, you know, surely even that should be discussed. You know, OK, you think it was, like, not you, but somebody thinks it was a like a coup. And the people say, well, no, it's not a coup. Some people say it was a fascist. The people say it's not a fascist. In a mature democracy, they are exactly the sort of things that you should be able to talk about. Not say, if you take one side of that, that proves you're a fascist who wants a coup, which is effectively what's being said. And also proves, by the way, and then they might as well throw it all in. So they then say, by the way, you are also a racist. Uh, who are also this, you're also that. And, you know, people do feel, and this sort of sense of unfairness, or there's one rule for them and one rule for us, I think it's very important to grasp at the moment, because people do feel that, well, what happened in relation to the the riots in the US around uh, uh, race questions in the summer were treated differently Right than the way the uh, the the attack on Capitol Hill, and I think that they they, they I can understand why people feel that frustration. You know, you'll be amused to know him. I mean, if you go on an anti-lockdown demonstration here, 
there's they're very small but you know if you go on one you get rounded up you get arrested you get called a COVID idiot a denier and fined enormously and sometimes put in jail if you go on a black lives matters demo that doesn't happen to you and what's more is the extinction rebellion protesters seem to be forever out and about doing things and seem to get away with it right now you can imagine right you to to, to ordinary people they're looking and they're thinking why is that then why come if you're an environmentalist on an Extinction Rebellion demo or you're a critical race theorist activist on a Black Lives Matters demo, you know, but then I want to go on a demonstration that says we shouldn't close down the whole of Stockport because there's never going to be any industry anymore and we don't think it's right, that I'm treated like a pariah and they're not. Well, and in justice, justice is one of those things that if you've been surrounded by it your whole life, it's like water. You don't really understand what it's like to be in a position where you feel like there was an injustice and no one's coming to help you. I, I'm reminded I lived uh, for two years with a guy from Afghanistan. He was a Fulbright scholar, and he told me something. I remember where I was when I heard it because it shocked me so much. He said, when the Taliban came into Afghanistan, the people welcomed them. And if you think that people don't welcome them right now, you're wrong. The reason that they welcome them is that the Taliban, when they came in, they enacted justice. Now you could go to somebody that would serve as a judge and it, they weren't a warlord. They didn't like take bribes. They didn't, they had a system and they installed it. And once it was installed, then everybody knew where their place was and how they fit. And that was stability. And they would rather have that with the incredible repressive uh, measures that they put in than having fueling warlords that that uh, never really knew who was going to get justice when and where. And when I think about that, I think nobody wants that, but they would choose it over being unstable. I think that's an important thing to remember right now. Yeah, I, I think one of the most uh, vile things about authoritarianism, you know, author totalitarian regimes is the arbitrary nature of them, is the arbitrary nature of terror knowing you know not knowing whether they will come for you not you know it's not even that there's a set of rules it's the fact that somebody can make the rules up as they go along right we so as you say it's not even the repression it's that you know if you think about east eastern europe or, or you know under, under stalinism and east germany and the stasi and all that it's like somebody could listen into your conversation privately and report you you, not even for doing anything, but for saying wrong thing, you know, saying the wrong thing around the dinner table, all of these kind of things. Well, that's how people feel at the moment. They feel as though it's all a bit arbitrary, right? They don't know what rules it is they're breaking. And when, you know, I want to make clear for your listeners, um, you know, pretty obviously, but just to clear, be clear, black lives do matter. Of course they do. We're talking about a systematic though, uh, rewriting of uh, fighting racism around identity politics in which you can be arbitrarily called a racist because you don't sign up to an academic way of looking at uh, identity politics. If you don't go along or use the correct language, you can be damned as a racist. That is like tyrannical rule where you can't even be sure that you won't have your motives impugn no matter what you think so you know it doesn't you know you can be the nicest person the the, the the you know with the best intentions in the world if somebody listening to you decides to dub you a bigot you can be done over and that yep. is a frightening place to be and i'll tell you the the th <laughs> when i think about that i think about um the thing called struggle sessions and i always ask people when they start talking about identity politics have you ever heard of struggle sessions? And most people are like, no, they have no idea. Stadiums would be filled with people and just regular people marched in there and they had to talk about why their privilege allowed them to do these things and it wasn't fair and they should, they regret all of it. And they would wear heavy chains and hats that would pull their heads down. And that is like the step that we're in now actually occurred in Maoist China before the struggle sessions. So if we're seeing this happen, what is it that we can do to block before that next step? Because I don't want struggle sessions for anybody. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm afraid I think we've gone past that point. I mean, I think in, in American universities and the UK universities, those struggle sessions are happening. 
I mean, they're happening increasingly. And you think about that letter that was in uh, um, Vanity Fair that, that happened. I mean, God, it, the, the, it's hard to remember it now, but it was a letter by liberals against cancel culture. I mean, the most liberal types, if you remember. I and don't they remember got this. Give me the whole yeah, story. They, they, uh, the <coughs> Vanity Fair published a... a uh, a signature uh, signed letter by hundreds of people, arts and literary and uh, academic types, who basically said, you know, we as effectively they said we as kind of lefty liberals are worried about the fact that lefty liberals are cancelling people and cancel culture is <laughs> uh -oh. a problem. Uh -oh, so uh, they're in uh, trouble. <laughs> exactly, and they, I mean, I, I, that's the best way of explaining what it was. But anyway, I, no sooner had the letter come out than there was attempts at cancelling all the people who'd signed the letter and saying why so and so on there and why so and then some people denouncing people who'd signed it and people who had signed it being surrounded in their struggle session by their friends saying why are you signing on a letter with that person and then they say i now want to withdraw my signature and all of this kind of thing i i, I think that the the atmosphere of the kind of maoist uh, cultural revolution that you described so well in the struggle sessions is really happening now people are being asked to denounce their views um, you know, the slogan that came out during the summer um, of silence is violence is an incredibly uh, passive aggressive threatening um, uh, slogan because it, it doesn't say that you it doesn't it's not even a, an attack on your free speech. It basically says you have to speak compelled speech. You have to say what we say. Otherwise, it's the equivalent, you know, silence. If you say silent, if you don't go along with us. Right. You are being violent and the violence was associated with the brutal killing of a black man by police officers so you know immediately you find that if you don't reiterate the given narrative of a particular organization you're put into the same position as somebody who has just killed a black person because of their skin color i mean it's impossible that is the end of freedom of conscience and it's like a kind of equivalent struggles uh, session. Well, so it's, I, you know, one of the fundamental time. one of the fundamental discoveries during the Enlightenment was that uh, if you don't know the answer to something, if you in encounter a philosophical argument, it is OK for you to not have an answer for for there to be like a, we don't know. Whereas when you're living in some sort of religious society, there are no unknowns there. Like we know everything already. And everyone must come to this conclusion because if you don't, you're not a part of the religion. And that the important philosophical discovery that we had as we were moving out of the dark ages was it's okay for us to draw a line and say, there are things that either we don't know as a group or I myself don't know. And therefore the act of not making an assertion is actually a philosophical charity or something. It's, it's the right thing to do. I think that's absolutely right. I, I mean, I, I, I'm worried that I'm coming over as being overly pessimistic, but I think there well, are Well, you did very... think the struggle sessions are already here and we're headed that way, so it I wasn't know, exactly I, I, optimistic. I, 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 I don't want to be, I don't want to be too... The, the one thing that I suppose, the, the only thing that, or, or to, to have a more slightly more positive take on it, um, one of the things that's happened in relation to having a state now in the UK anyway, but also the rest of Europe and partly in America that is effectively taken it upon itself to remove freedoms through this lockdown period and to deprive people of everyday decisions in relation to their own liberty has at very least, and this is the only positive bit, reminded people what freedom is and what it feels like not to be free rather horrendously rather a lot of people have gone along with it without even a murmur <laughs> but most people realize they don't like it and even the everyday freedoms are suddenly when you're deprived of them you know and the you know you're not allowed to meet more than one person outside i mean you know so uh, freedom of association is completely banned freedom of speech completely on the road but what that's done is it's shone a spotlight on freedom and it gives those of us who care about freedom and see it as a foundational value 
and the opportunity to remake the arguments for freedom because at least people you know it's not irrelevant to discuss it it's become a key issue and i think actually as it happens the even the kind of struggle sessions the 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 kind of uh, the way that uh, identity politics suddenly was in the spotlight over the summer in particular, but it carries on, of course, in different forms, being in the spotlight in both the US and in the UK. Um, because it's, it's suddenly not just something that people discuss on university campuses. Everybody knows about it now. And that, again, gives you an opportunity to have those debates and discussions without sounding like as though you're kind of banging on some sort of as, you know, there's only a few people who people say, oh, he cares about statues, you know, it's just the sort of thing university students do. And then suddenly everybody cares about statues. What's your attitude on statues becomes a big thing. Um, this just kind of has universalized the conversation. And partly the fact that the whole world has gone through coronavirus means that also we have an opportunity to understand a little bit about the way we've all gone through this same experience. I mean, it will have taken different forms. And so I think that the more po the, the positive thing going forward is how we use this time, how we use the next time when we're going back to normal to ensure that those conversations are really given maximum amplification. Well, I have to say that for me, I um, really resisted the masks. I hate them, right? Like, And it's because I am a communicator. I love watching people's faces and seeing... Are they smiling? Are they happy? Are they aggressive? Are they whatever? But I had a, my wife and I had a baby during coronavirus. And I don't think I would have been so keyed into how important it is to develop the um, emotional visual language on your face had it not been for the masks. Because one of the things that I discovered is like a baby from the first four to six weeks, it only has crying and not crying. So it's a hostage taker, right? But as soon as it gets to smiling, which is about six weeks, now all of a sudden it can negotiate with you. And it spends over a year from that point until it can learn how to speak, not having words. And so most of our communication, more foundational than the words you and I are using, is the emotional visual language. And because of the masks, I've been so much more focused on that. But then the more focused I've become on it, actually, the more terrified I have been. The masks have got to go. We need to push them out as fast as is yeah. humanly possible. And it's horrible because here people, you know, in the public health, uh, you know, the kind of leading public health types are saying, well, even when we get back to a situation whereby we can stop locking down and relax some of the restrictions, the masks will stay forever. And, and you know, you just think this is, must be a threat, right? But, you know, your point about, um, uh, and congratulations, by the way, but your, your point about your baby is that, I, I'm sort of understanding something there. I mean, I was really shocked when a friend said to me, you've got to understand that my baby has never seen anyone apart from, you know, me and her dad um, without a mask on for nine months. You know, she's never seen anyone else's faces but ours, right? And um, I, 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 I was reminded of that because I was on a particularly uh, long uh, tube journey and there was a little child, you know, a baby uh, with, with her mother opposite who was kind of distracted. And I was, of course, smiling and, you know, kind of like, and then I realised I had the bloody mask on, right? And the child, towards <laughs> me, I mean, you could say, how foolish am I? But I realised that I, I like, like you say, you know, on tubes when there's, I kind of smile and, you know, and all this sort of thing. And I realised that the child couldn't see any of that. I had this big um, black thing over my face. And I, I was so sad that I'd, I mean, you know, that I didn't, I hadn't, even when those passing forms of communication or what we do without thinking about it, right? So that child doesn't know me, doesn't care, but you learn something about human beings when you're a baby and people smile at you. Whereas all you're seeing is this array of masks. It's not the same. So I think that's sort of a good analogy to my point about freedom, which is you do learn to appreciate some of the aspects of public life, civil society, social interaction, social solidarity that we've been deprived of. And I, I think we need to make a case for bringing them back as quickly as possible, as, as you just explained. 
So, Claire, I can clearly talk to you all night, but uh, but I'm going to wrap up. But I have a question for you. You're now the man, right? You're a baroness. You're in the government. And yet you have been a person that has pushed back on, um, you know, tyrannical rules or the things that you didn't want to see. What guidance do you have for people on how they ratchet up how they're heard by their government? You know, it goes from voting to protest to civil disobedience like what should people know that have never gone through the fight that you've gone through oh god I, i'm not even sure but but right so uh, first of all there's no there's no uh, at the moment there's no right to protest in the uk if you did that you just get arrested and people keep saying to me well what can we do we can't even do that um and I, I'm, I'm afraid that my advice at the moment is to bide one's time because until things go back to normal, it's going to be very difficult. But what, what I would say is to avoid yourself getting dragged into the sewer and to, and to not uh, um, caricature one's opponents, to try and set an example. Uh, we have to not succumb to a kind of fatalism that says it's always going to be like this. So we have to have a sort of sense of what we want. So you've just done a really ex a good example what do we want the world to be like when COVID's gone, right? And you say, take the masks off, appreciate human communication. You know, it's that kind of thing, right? That's actually a positive vision. Not constantly saying we're never going to, you know, we're, you know, not giving in to this idea that this is the way it has to be, but to start describing the way that we want the world to be. You know, the new, that the, the, the old normal comes back and we appreciate this, 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 and this about it. And to start making the arguments for that now so that people don't just say, oh, well, we've got used to wearing masks, what's wrong with it? Say, no, we shouldn't do that. You know, I'm not saying take your masks off now if it's not safe. I'm saying the reason why masks are a tyranny is because it stops us communicating with each other. And so they're a temporary necessity. We should not make a virtue of that necessity. And just, as I say, not to caricature one's opponents because I think, we all have an obligation now not to try and stir up or fuel the uh, animosities and the polarizations that are so toxically uh, destroying any sense of social solidarity. And uh, as I say, that doesn't, it doesn't mean you don't have to believe things or it doesn't mean that you don't have to, it doesn't mean you have to sit there and go this side versus that side, because you might well be on one side of the argument, but just not if you are on that side of the argument to treat your opponents um in the way that you know is going to just immediately antagonize them so it's trying to take people seriously you know and, and 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 avoid being the troll that you hate yourself that sort of thing so um but it's a time you know we have to bide our time i mean what we're doing at the academy of ideas is we've just launched a new series of things called pamphlets called letters on liberty making the point that we need to we need to remake arguments we took for granted before in terms of freedom. You know, you can't just say free speech anymore and expect anyone to agree with you because you've got to remake arguments. You've got to find new ways of bringing arguments to life. And pamphleteering was a hugely important part of uh, the emergence of the public sphere in the UK. Historically, people went, were, were, you know, pamphleteering, discussing the pamphlets in the pub. And so they're a bit old fashioned, but we physically made these pamphlets so that we make the point we're going back to pamphleteering even though obviously they're online as well um and um and we're carrying on doing our zoom uh debates and the reason i'm saying that is because i think you have to then say okay we might be locked down for two more months we might have this to face we might have that to do but we are not being thwarted we're not giving in we're going to carry on and don't allow yourself to be intellectually locked down it doesn't mean at the moment so when you say how do you how do you it make an impression on politicians. The final thing, I suppose, which is the political elites in both countries have no more contact with the public than you or I do if you're locked down. That's the point is, in a way, the public sphere is evaporated. And so sadly, they're dependent on, you know, polling, you know, those hideous polls and the media, far too influential in representing what the public thinks. And then they kind of look at social media as well and they think, oh, they're all lunatics. I, I think we need to rebuild rebuild the public sphere so that we start to have a voice because the political uh, the politicians, in my opinion, realize they're in a bubble, but don't know how to get out of it. And so we've got to find ways of talking to them that's not just screaming at them. 
Um, I don't know, but that at the moment means writing, means podcasts, it means getting them out, get, encouraging people, people should to be share sending their. I think people should be sending their representatives this podcast over and over and over again. <laughs> that sort of thing. And just <laughs> make them think there's another way of considering this. Well, Baroness Claire Fox, it is always a pleasure. If people wanted to learn more about the um, the Academy of Ideas and how to find you, where would they do that? So that's academyofideas.org.uk. And uh, I, I look forward to hearing from you. And um, yes, you can contact me. Look at the Academy of Ideas website if you want to email me. Uh, find me on Twitter on Fox underscore Claire. And I can even be contacted at the House of Lords uh, in the public domain, should you wish to email me there. Well, I can tell you that I really enjoy watching your speeches from the House of Lords. So keep posting them. It's uh, great for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, impressed with your um, pursuit for sovereignty without blood, without anything. You did it through the mechanisms and we can all learn something from that. Thank you very much. <laughs>